Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to Making It. I'm Terry Woolman, and this show is about creating a successful life. And what that means to my guest today, one of the most recorded drummers in R&B music, James Gadsden. I'd like to share my intention that inspires this podcast. Time passes quickly, and I've learned that we should do what's in our hearts and do it well without apologies or excuses. I encourage you to create your life and art in your own unique way and express your artistry with joy and with abandon. Be willing to work uncompromisingly for what you believe in. Success will have a better chance of finding you when you live your life with integrity, focus, and passion. Be selfish with your discipline and selfless in your performance, and don't forget to have fun along the way. If you're joining us in our live audience, we'll be inviting questions and comments during the second half of the show, so make it count. Simply request an invite to speak, and we'll bring you up on stage to join our conversation. Let me tell you about my guest. James Gadsden is a drummer, producer, singer, and songwriter. Born in Kansas City, he naturally took to the drums as a teen with the influence of his father, Harold, who was a prominent drummer in the local music scene. James eventually found his way to L.A. and joined the legendary 60s soul group Dyke and the Blazers, where he laid down drums on Let a Woman Be a Woman, which later would be sampled on Public Enemy's Welcome to the Terror Dome. After Dyke's tragic murder, James and other members of the Blazers would end up forming the Watts 103rd Street Band, which, with the help of Bill Cosby, secured a record deal with Warner Brothers. One of their best-known songs was Express Yourself, which was sampled by Dre for NWA's Express Yourself. This was just the beginning for Gadsden's prolific career, which next found him collaborating with Bill Withers, producing, writing, and playing on the successful Still Bill LP, which featured Use Me, Lean On Me, and the very funky Kissing My Love. He became one of the most sought-out studio drummers, playing on over 300 gold records and over a 1,000 recordings. James played on Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On, the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack, Herbie Hancock's Manchild, and has also recorded with artists Beck, Paul McCartney, the Isley Brothers, Frank Sinatra, Joe Cocker, Justin Timberlake, and Ray Charles. James, I'm going to turn your video back on and welcome you to the show. There you are. All right. Uh, so welcome. It's it's great to see you and to have you here. Great to see you and great to be on your show. Thank you. It's going to be a great conversation. Um, wow. Yeah, one of the things about the show that I love is, is it's an unedited hour of conversation about anything that's important to my guest. And we have the opportunity to speak about things that... Uh, we don't often get to to speak about as freely on other shows, so uh, so I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. And I wanted to to just start by you know talking about your early years. You know, you you began your career in the late '60s, but I want to talk about growing up in Kansas City and your dad's influence and and your brother Tootie's influence as well on you. Well, um, I didn't start playing drums until I was 21. I uh, was a, yeah, because you were a singer first, correct? Yeah, I was an inspiring, inspiring, aspiring doo wop. I thought that I was going to be a uh, you know great until I so, so, so Frankie Lyman came in. It kind of broke my face, you know, <laughs> when he came in yeah. because my voice hadn't changed at that time, and I was I was singing. You know, I was my voice was pretty high. I was singing pretty high, so. Uh, I uh, went into the Air Force, mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I came out of the Air Force, unbeknownst to me, my brother he had a he had a working band. The whole time I, I was in the Air Force for four years, the whole time I was in the Air Force, I had no idea that he was had studied the guitar. So when he he enjoyed, he invited me into his band when I came out, and. Uh, As played, a singer, I played. I played about you know. I could play three or four chords on the keyboard, and mm -hmm. we set up the keyboard because he already had the drummer, and he, you know. So the drum, the bass player left the group, and the drummer 
was a bass player. He wanted to play bass. So uh, the drums set fell in my lap, as they said. My brother said, man, you can do it. You can do this. I had played, uh, I never had played a set of drums, but I had played with the Drum and Bugle Corps with the American Legion, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in my teen years. Playing snare? Just, just, yeah, just snare drum. Yeah. You know, you know. And so uh, I said, well, okay, well, I'll try it. So uh, I uh, would practice. And the good thing about it was while we were practicing, we were singing too. So I'm learning how to sing and play the drums at the same time. So That's so interesting to me, James, because one of the things that is so unique about your playing, besides your pocket and your groove, is the melodic approach that you have. You really are understanding the lyrics and and you know playing the melody or playing or with the melody. It's it's like the drums are duet with the, with the singer. Always. I guess that's, that comes from being a singer, I right? Guess. Yeah, you know, yes. Wow. So, so did you? How did you? How did you do that? Because there's a lot of coordination. There's a big difference. I I I came up playing snare drum also. Uh, you know, in my early years, I was learning snare drum and some p- piano and guitar, but never moved to the full kit. My parents really didn't want me to be a drummer. You know, it was too much noise. Well, in the same as mine. Right. My parents didn't want me to be in the music business at all. Even though your dad played drums. Exactly. Is he that the reason why? In the music business. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had a, a rough time. He didn't drive a car. Did your mom drive? No. Okay. My mom did play piano. She could play. Uh, she could play. Mm-hmm. You know, she could play if she would read the music. Right. You Got know, it. That was her thing. If she was reading the music, she could play. Right. And you actually learned to read music when you came to LA, correct? Uh, I went to school. I played trumpet in high school. Ah. Uh-huh. And, um, I could have learned to play music, but I was like kind of like a juvenile delinquent. I was going to high school and uh, playing trumpet, but in my heart, I wanted to be a doo-wop singer. Right. So I would go out the back door a lot of days and drink wine with the fellas. As they mm-hmm. say, you know? <laughs> and uh, what eventually happened when I, when I um, went to Motown, I was... Uh, in the studio one day and a contract came up to me and said, James Gatson, Motown's been looking for you for two years. Can you read music? I said, yes, I was lying. <laughs> so I started to do the Motown sessions and they'd have the music and I was scared to death. I'm looking at this music. Of course. And, uh, and for about 12 sessions, it had to be no less than 12. I just, it was, I destroyed it. But for some reason or another, they kept me. But in meanwhile, I got me some books some you know some books about reading and i right. would go home every day and and i would read and study until the motown would keep calling me and uh to i guess four or five o'clock in that morning so i'd be sleepy but i was you know eventually i was able to get it together as far as reading the drum charts and stuff you know? and were there so. some other musicians in the sessions who were kind and helpful to you or were they not making it easy well the, but the, most of the producers were great. Right. You know, they were great. Most of the producers were great. Mm-hmm. They, uh, you know, they would tell me, you know, Norman Whitfield and Hal Davis were very not kind to me. Mm-hmm. They were very kind to me. You know? Right. And... Did, so so they uh, were encouraging, you know, and, and they knew that what you brought to the table was still rock solid. Right. And even if you had other skills to to Well, I guess up, what happened was... to the same level. When I left, I, I played with a group called the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band. And they had a big record out called Express Yourself, and one that was almost as big called Loveland. And I was right. the, I sang the song Loveland. Mm-hmm. I, and I remember that group. I was still in Miami back then. What what year was that? Early 66, around when you moved out to L.A.? Well, I think 
Um, or actually, no, that was six, like 1968 to 70, correct? Well, yes. So I was still living in Miami and I, I knew your group. You know, we were already hearing them across the country. So that's a pretty I big hit. I love Miami. Yeah, you, you I lived went, there I went like to back Miami, in... I guess in 1962 with my brothers, we got a, um, a uh, what, what would you call it? A booking agent that w wasn't really a booking agent. Tricked us down there. Mm -hmm. And I decided to stay because it was so exciting because, I mean, I got to see, I mean, from the all the R&B acts, the rock acts, uh, I got to see Duke Ellington and Count Basie. I got to see these big bands and everything. So it was Miami was very, very exciting to me. Yeah. So it was you know, a great time I, to be there. Yeah, it was wonderful. It was wonderful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not as great now politically. A little rougher. Well, it's a little strange down there right now. Yeah. I, I, I'm it is. Checking it out. And, uh, you know, you know, I don't, you know, everybody to their own, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I agree. Yeah. You know, I, you know, it's all about Jesus with me. So, yeah. And, and it's about love and respect. Right. That's and, right. and not about fear and, right. and disrespect or blatant racism. And I feel you know, a man. Yeah. Right. Just everybody just no, like, that's, 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 that's what it <laughs> pull is together. With me. You know. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So you, you have a strong uh, spiritual background. Is that something that you had throughout your entire life or is it? No, I am. Uh, now. I mean, when I was a young, uh, you know, I guess five, six, seven, all the way up to 10, we were required to go to church. My grandfather was a, he was a deacon in the church. And, mm -hmm. and so, uh, I noticed, you know, my mother and her sisters, they would always sing over to his house when he was alive. They would sing these spiritual songs. And uh, so we were required to go to church. Uh, then uh, my mother passed away and my grandfather passed away. And uh, it kind of defrayed us from going to church again for some reason. I just didn't go mm -hmm. because of the church. It wasn't the same church, you know, um, when he was there for some reason or another. Right. But um, <clears throat> I, I would all through my life I was uh, think about you know God Almighty and how, the love and how wonderful He is and how wonderful love is. So I'm in and out and in and out, you know, uh, and. Uh, one thing that really happened to me was I got, I got cancer. How long ago was that? That was about 23 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, I didn't know what treatments to take. It was different treatments, and I didn't know what treatments to take. But I was working out to a, a university from time to time with the uh, – teachers at the university, you know, mm -hmm. the professors. And we had a, I was on Saturday nights, we had a, as they call it, a gig, we had a job that we played. And uh, on the, the guys that were working the Friday nights at the same club was, they was the ones that got the gig for us. I didn't know mm -hmm. that later on. But anyway, they asked me, they said, man, the drummer won't be there this Sunday. Can you come and sit in? We'll give you $125, which uh, and uh, we'll feed your breakfast. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'll do it. I mean, it, you know, things were kind of persistent. So I did it. I played, came in, and now they had charts. You know, they had this church. Yeah, this church, they had charts. They had the charts, charts set up. So I played, and uh, we had breakfast, and I, the second service, they had two services. I came in, I sat down in the second service, and uh they were laying uh, laying on of hands, as they called it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very uh, partial that I didn't know. You know, they said, Gatson, come on, come on up here. We will lay hands on you. I was, 
I, I, I got up. I didn't want to do it, but I, I got mm -hmm. up. I went up to the uh, where they were perform, you know, doing the laying of the hands. Mm -hmm. And when they laid hands on me, I have never had a feeling like that. I could the, a feeling of peace. I mean, it was wonderful. Wow! It didn't cure the cancer, but it was so peaceful. Mm -hmm. And I knew that uh, you know God was in my life. Right so, in that uh, moment, yeah. You know, they opened up another church later on, and I, then I played in, and I've been in church, I've been in church ever since. Mm -hmm. You know, what cured the cancer? Good doctors? No, mm -hmm. no, it's not cured. I mean, okay. I'm in remission. You're in remission. It's not cured, but uh, but for a long time. You know, How are you feeling? Because you you look. Yeah, I've been dealing with it for 23 years. Yeah. All praises to God Almighty. I yeah. mean, I'm still here. So that's a wonderful thing. But you, you know, James, you you I'm look say, great. Like I'm, you're you you look vibrant. How are you feeling? Well, I mean, I feel good. You know, I I have truly been blessed. Mm -hmm. I have no pains or nothing. Good. Well, that means I mean, I have a little arthritis, well, <laughs> big arthritis in my knees. Yeah. It. I still play. It does. I, it's a little rough to walk, but I can play. I have yeah. no no uh, pain playing or nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, you know, I'm cool. Yeah. Especially at my age, you know, so. And yeah. you're still based in LA. And I just, I want people to know you're, you're playing live. You're, you're playing in some local clubs again, but you're also right. still doing re recording sessions and you are also available. You know, people That's might cool. not think that people forget, but you know, if anybody's interested, you know, they can find you and and you'll show up and play on the record right now, I you know, sure because will. you love playing music. I sure will. There's no yeah. problem about that. How's the best way for folks to find you? Well, I mean, they can uh Your website or Instagram or Facebook. They can email my email um is G J Y M at AOL dot com. They can email go. me and we can talk about the business and great. You know, I'd be glad to do it. I mean, I, I'm in my studio at the present time and I do a lot of uh, work here. You know, people send me things and, uh, right. People send you tracks I, uh, and you record in your own studio as well. Correct. I record them and send them back to them. Yeah. Great. Are you pretty and tech I'm doing savvy? A little project now where I'm singing mm -hmm. for some, uh, it's a small company that's writing songs and I'm singing it. So, so you know, I'm having a, I'm having a ball. It's great. I'm I'm so happy to hear it, and and thank you for sharing your email address because I encourage anybody and everybody to take advantage of the the opportunity. I know, um, not that long ago, a few years back, a, a mutual friend of ours, Mindy Abear, you know, reached out to you, and you played on on two of her records, actually, I believe, and. Uh, and I thought that was so great when you did that. And, and, um, uh, you know, a few years back, boy, it's probably even longer, but, uh, we did something with Kebmo together, you know, and you were at that studio and that would, that was a really great session. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm so grateful that the younger, uh, musicians and singers, they, they, uh, a lot of them call me and they like what I do. And that that's truly a blessing for me. Well, I mean, let's I, talk I, about I, that I'm, for a minute. I'm in, like, all, I'm in all of that. You know, I don't take it for granted, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, well, even recently, you know, just this 2023, you, you played with Philip Bailey on State of the Art. Uh, or actually, it's a re-release, it looks like, on that record. But uh, you've worked with Robert Palmer last year. Uh, Paul yeah. McCartney, John Batiste, Nancy Wilson, Florence and the Machine, uh, the year before Keith Urban, Harry Styles, uh, Beck. Yeah, you that know, was there's, a gas. Harry's thing was great. Yeah, I, I was guess. curious what what was that like for you? You know, working with Harry. Oh, it was uh, it was a wonderful time because uh, they had requested me. They, you know, they said, "Well, of course, is the uh, Bill Withers drummer still living?" <laughs> well, let's get him in here. So, <laughs> so I was, I mean, it was, you know, it was great. You know, I, we had a good time and, uh, 
everybody was cordial. You know, I, right. I it was it was enjoyable. Yeah, and it must have been really a kick for Harry Styles as well. You know, to to have you know to have your approach, you know, your sound, your your vibe, your heart, you know, because you put your heart in it when you play as well. Um, you, you know, on their music, you know, I I saw uh, even I would imagine it was was the same when Justin Justin Timberlake called you in. He must have oh, been. Oh, it was great. I'm, I'm in awe himself. when. When you know, when any of the young artists call um, Rick Rubin, who was a, a top producer, yeah, had a lot to do with that. Okay, and um, through him, I played with a lot of young artists because he favored a lot of the things that I did, and you know, mm -hmm. th that's a blessing. I look at that; that's just wonderful. I, th I think it's wonderful. I mean, I did during the uh, COVID. I mean, it's calmed down now, but uh, a lot of people called me, and I was because I've had, I have COPD and asthma, and so mm -hmm. I didn't. You know, people say, "Well, hey, it's cool," you know, we, you know, nobody's sick here, and such. But I still didn't go. Sure. Yeah. But and I probably lost a lot of uh, contacts, as they say, or clients. Maybe but, uh, James, but but also you're still here having this I'm conversation here, a so lot of people are not here because of covid that's true and, and it's a blessing that i am still here yeah likewise yeah. you know yeah we it's, it's wonderful. you know we were uh very isolated and and still got sick you know when you know just about two years ago when people started touring again you know and we started to get out there again you know we we ended up getting covid even being vaccinated and so um, yeah, were you I, able to stay healthy all through that, or did no, you? No, I, I caught COVID twice. And you did. I had, all right. I had all my vaccinations and a mask. <laughs> right. You're and so, uh, you know, the second time that I caught it, uh, the uh, doctor said, "Well, hey, man, you know, a mask is uh, helps a little bit, but it really doesn't." And so, right. this is what it was. But they yeah. had by that time. The most times that I called it, they they had some medicine, Paxavoid, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, it really, it really helped me. So, absolutely, all praises to God for that. You know, that's great. So, you know, I th one of the things that I think people don't know about you, you know, you're known as an R&B drummer from from working with Quincy Jones and Randy Crawford and. Uh, you know, and, and of, of course, Bill Withers and Temptations. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. Um, but you've also played with some jazz greats also and and other people that might be unexpected, like Leonard Cohen. You played on the Future record in 1992. You played with Boz Skaggs and um, Kenny Rankin and, and the wonderful Phoebe Snow, you know, and one of my favorite records. Phoebe was a really special person. As yes, you, I would you know, imagine, I came to California. I was a bebop drummer, as they call it. That's all right. I so could you, not you, play R and B. I had you couldn't. <laughs> That's I cool. could not play R and B. I had a uh, graduated when the B three organ got real popular. Then I started to playing with the B three organ players and the outside guys that were playing the outside music. Yeah, and so how I got to California. Some friends of mine who were doo-wop singers when we all were going to school together, they had established a wonderful uh, following, and they were on the Dean Martin show. Mm -hmm. And so I thought they had made the big times, which they right. were pretty popular in, in the hotels all around the world. Mm -hmm. But they sent for me to come to California. I came to California, and I couldn't play their music, and they were playing R pop R&B. I couldn't play it because I was a straight-ahead bebop drummer. Right. So I had to start all over again and, uh, you know, learn how to play R&B. And the, so and the reason how did why you, how did you learn to play R&B or who did you listen I to? I would go to different jazz clubs. I mean, I was, it was pretty rough for me out here because mm -hmm. they couldn't use me. So I couldn't work. I had just gotten right. married. I had a child. I would walk 50 blocks sometimes to, to go to a jazz club to, you know, to set in as they call it, to see if I could get hired. Right. But nobody knew me, and I would ask the guys, you know, man, can I sit in? We don't, we don't know you, you know. So 
it was pretty, 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 pretty rough. But I had, I had, I came to California prior to the time that I moved out here with mm-hmm. an organ trio. And I met a drummer by the name of John Boudreau, who was a famous drummer in New Orleans. He played on a lot of the hit records and he played jazz as well as R&B. And so I kept his number. I happened to find his number for some reason. And I said, man, I'm starving to death out here. He said, man, I'll get you a gig, as they call it, a gig, a job. So he got me a job with a guy by the name of Charles Wright, sure. who later became, it was Charles Wright and the Wright Sounds at that time, which later became Charles Wright and the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band. Mm-hmm. And uh, he fired me about five times <laughs> because I couldn't play <laughs> hard beat. So I don't, I don't, I guess he couldn't get anybody else. So he just had me to play fours, as they call it, four, four, four beats to a four, four measure on, on the feet, on the foot, as they call it, on the snare and on the hi hat. And that was the hardest thing in the world for me to do because I was, I was free, as they call it, you know. Right. Yeah, but sure. uh, eventually, you know, I had to play that because I, you know, I didn't want to starve to death, and I had a family. Right. And I was trying to, you know, I would get on the bus. Uh, and go to the go to his job, you know, because mm-hmm. it was a Thursday night and it was a strip club and the strippers were off, <clears throat> and I was making thirteen dollars. That was that was no money, but if thirteen dollars was great, you know, I just needed anything that I could, you know. Right, right. But eventually, I got after, after about seven eight months of playing, you know, fours, I started to be able to hear the R and B legend as they would call it the, the how to play that and the the 16 notes thing that people um you know they they liked the way i played those notes 16 mm-hmm. notes. um he didn't like them at first he didn't want me to play them he just wanted four because motown had a, they would just play four 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 a sure. lot of the, their uh, records had the four beat but eventually i eased the 16 notes in and he got a big hit out of Express Yourself. He sure he did. Sung that and and I played also played the 60 notes on a song called Love Land. Right. That was a big pop hit that I sang on. Right. And you're talking about so, the hi hat 16th notes? Yeah, the 16 notes yeah. on the hi hat. So yeah. that uh kind of uh was my uh specialty. You know, a lot of people like the 16 notes. They like the way I played them. And even on the uh even the disco stuff, I would play the 16 notes with the opening and the closed hi hats. You know, that was my sound style and playing. You know, a lot of the uh, disco stuff. Well, so, one uh, one that was a, iconic that was a blessing. That was a yeah. truly a blessing. You know? That that doesn't surprise me because one of the iconic examples of that is on Bill Withers' "Use Me Up," where right where your hi hat part has become one of the hooks of the song. You know, when, you know, when you would open and close that hi hat on the 16th notes. Right. And, um, I mean, that it, was, it's, you know, we, when really I was memorable. with Bill Withers, we would, we would rehearse when we were on the road a okay. lot of times. So right. we were in Spokane, Washington. I'll never forget that. And we were out on the patio rehearsing and I came, I had came up with that beat mm-hmm. and uh, he said, well, man, put on the end of it. The next thing I know, when we got back to Los Angeles, we were in the studio mm-hmm. recording that rhythm. He hadn't right. he hadn't written. We recorded the rhythm. He hadn't written. He hadn't. It was no songs of that yet. And that, oh, it was a group. Eventually, groove. that became right. a, a a really big hit for him. It sure did. You know. And I think also really defined you as a drummer you know, at least in recorded music. I mean, because I I know singers who will stop and sing your drum parts, you know, on that particular song. You know, I mean, it's really memorable and catchy. You know? And, yeah, it was just a blessing. And it feels good. Um, I just, something, you know, how we drummers do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we experiment and we're experimenting all the time. Right. And so I... Uh, I came up with that, and uh, it paid off for him. Yeah, and uh, it uh, brought my name into into pop know, history and R and B history. So, yeah, 
you know, it was it was it was a turning point. So it was it was great. It was a great Were thing. That one and kissing my love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great song as well. What about collaborating with Marvin Gaye, like playing on "I Want You" in 1976? Well, was that did Marvin you Gaye? Work I don't those know parts was, out together. Yeah, I don't know. I had I I have done some sessions with him before mm-hmm. with a group that he was producing, and uh, when we did the "I Want You" album. I didn't see him in the studio. He was—he probably—he might have been in the control room. I didn't see him. Right. But the, the "I Want You" song came into uh, existence because we were waiting on the music, and the music was two hours late. And and I had been in Motown, I guess, about two and a half years, and I was worried about if they were going to pay me double scale. <laughs> Was the music going to get there? I was, you know, right. how musicians are. I was a little right. You want to get paid. It. So I just started playing. Boom, 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 boom. You know, yeah. boom, boom, boom. And so I played. I was just going playing, and I, and the next thing I know, Chuck Rainey came in. Boom, boom. He was playing. Yeah. So, um, Leon Ware, who was the producer, he came out from the control room and kept waving said keep going keep going and so um that's how that happened so the next time i heard it it was i want you (laughs) you know know, i mean well i heard the changes (laughs) that the car changes and and the things Mm -hmm. of that nature yeah you know But but doing that album was a it was a wonderful experience you know because i got to play Mm -hmm. a lot of different um I guess styles that that I was accustomed to, right? You know that that you know that came from me. So you know it was it was it was really nice, really nice. I had a I had an enjoyable time in there with the musicians and the we had you know we had good times, really right. good times. Well, it comes through in the music. You can feel it. You can absolutely yeah. feel it. And Leon Ware it turned out to be. Uh, a longtime friend and collaborator of yours. I mean, you did a lot of projects together, didn't you? You continued working with Leon as well on other projects. uh, You know, other projects with him. I did a a Mm -hmm. couple of albums that he sang on. Right. And, you know, different productions that he produced. Mm -hmm. What what a wonderful, God rest his soul, what a wonderful uh, songwriter. Yeah. uh, Yeah. I totally agree. I, I met him in the early '80s when I moved out here. And how, um, you know, how wonderful it was to work with him. The, the imagination mm-hmm. that, uh, was, you know, it was like you were free, and you were, you know, in a way of speaking, the way that it, the way he put the music together, it was just, mm-hmm. it was uh, incredible. You know, you, you know, know, all the producers. Thing... I, I mean, well, they all that I had worked with a. Uh, Norman Whitfield and the Hal Davises and the uh, Carmichael's. Mm-hmm. Uh, great producers. I mean, I learned so much. I always learned. I always learned the way when, when I was in the studio, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and today, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to learn. You know, just music is so vast and it's, you know, it's... Uh, it keeps rolling. I mean, certain, the newness, you know, you never know, you know, that's why I'm so thankful that the young people still like me, you know? Right. So it's, it's, Hey, I'm, 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 I feel blessed and, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, you know, especially when I'm, uh, making music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can relate to that. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very happy when, when I'm creating music, especially collaborating with other people who I respect, you know, it's, it, there's something incredibly spiritual and joyful about that. You oh, know, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, some days it could be strange. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very sensitive and spiritual idiom. I mean, it's, uh, well, so, you know, music is so uh, vast. Well, it's let's so talk about that for a moment because you, 
you're absolutely right. And sometimes you're in a situation in a recording studio or a tour or a TV show where not everybody's open hearted. You know, they're, they're, you know, they might not be the nicest people, you know, or there might be somebody in there who's not cool, but you still got to figure out a way to create that intimacy and connect it, you know, to be connected and, and stay open. That's very and, true. And it's not always yeah, easy. You have, you have, especially if you're a studio musician, you have to, uh, right. You got to bring it as they call it. Right. Whatever the situation might be. I mean, mm-hmm. and I've, I've, uh, you know, uh, you under, of course it's very sensitive. So I've, I've been under pressure a lot of times and, uh, was able to come out, you know, uh, positive, but, you know, well, because I mean, how do you do that, is, James? What's your, sensitive. well, I just had to, uh, be calm, just calm down and, uh, mm-hmm. not let my, uh, personality, you know, uh, get, get negative, you know, I just had to, and you just, you know, and when you, you know, especially when you're working in the studios and you're working for, you know, you, you're, you're, you're not the leader. I mean, people will ask you from time to time, but a lot of times, what do you think about this? And what, what, what would you play here? Or what would you try? Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, it's still, sometimes a person might have a, a negative way of trying to bring out something that they want to hear in the music. I mean, it's, it's such, so, so many different facets of this that could, get, you know, that could happen, you know, and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's all in a day's work and it's all about the music. Well, you I know? I've learned as well because you know, both of us, as as well as being musicians and artists, we both produce music. And I've learned a lot about producing by being on the receiving end of what not to do when people are m- making it more difficult, when they're yelling at you, when they're berating you, when they're not lifting you, you know, or, and, and, or we're, you know, just this, you know, what I consider, you know, watching them shut down people in the room. You know, because they're, you know, I, I mean, I remember like one of the first times seeing that in a session and thinking that doesn't seem like a really smart way to get the best out of somebody, you know, is, is by berating them or making them feel uncomfortable, you know, instead of finding a way to lift them. So it, that made me a better producer as well. But it, like you said, it's, you still have to rise to the occasion. Your job is still to show up and make it feel good. Yeah, you know, but you know, the best way to do it is when it's when it's when it's all about love. When it ain't about like when it Thank when you. it's not about right. that. Right. But I mean, there are situations. Some people, it's just that way. It just happens. I mean, everybody is different, mm-hmm. and uh, some people have a different way of. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is nervousness. Mm-hmm. When 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 we when you get the yelling and I think it's nervousness. I think that's what happens with a lot of people. So it's best to be calm under those circumstances, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, stand in I, agreement I found on that. that. To be true, you know, in, in my uh, since I've been doing it like that. Yeah. And, you know, well, I you've can, been doing I it can, a long time. Yeah. So and I so can you deal can... with it like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, as long as it doesn't get physical. Right. You know, get physical. And I've seen that. I mean, it hasn't happened to me, but I've seen that. And I think that that's, that's, that's very unmusical. It's not like that. (laughs) That's true. But, you know, that's, you know, this this is the world and everything is, is, uh, you know, all, all things uh, work. Right. Or they don't work. Right. So it's, it's like what that. were your experiences yeah. like working with Quincy Jones? Because I know that you've Quincy done some Jones projects with him. Quincy Jones is a master. Yes, sir. I mean, he's a master. He knows. I mean, I, I would have to say he knows exactly everything that he, uh, whatever he's doing. When he called me to work with him, he knew was 
what my limitations were, if I if I may say that, he knew what to call me for, mm -hmm. for me to do, and it and it was very comfortable. Of the whole, I mean, every time I worked for him, mm -hmm. he knew it was never. I never had any pressure with him. Right. Uh, you know, it was three producers like that. Uh, 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 the guy that produced uh, the Radiohead, Nigel. Mm -hmm. Nigel was fantastic. Right. And Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin. I mean, masters. You know, Rick Rubin said he doesn't know anything about music. Yeah, but you know what well, he knows about? Rick knows Rubin about, knows how to create a safe space for people to be creative. He knows, yes, right. And he knows that's his love. gift. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's wonderful when you work with yeah. I mean, it's like stepping into a <laughs> fairy tale land, <laughs> in a way of speaking. I mean, I look at it like that. I mean, when it's in a creative, you know, idiom. You know, it's so, you know, right. I, I mean, you know, so, yeah. Absolutely. You know, when, you know I, and I, every time, I mean, I, I I never would go to a session where I wouldn't try to give my all in all. You know, if I was sick, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't take the session. But Got that's, it. that's, right. that's my, uh, because music is, is a, it's a beautiful thing. And it's been wonderful to me. And I would be, I would want to be in, will be as long as I'm playing wonderful to it, mm -hmm. best of my ability. You know? I'm so glad you just said that because that's what I was thinking. You have also been wonderful to music. It's It's been uh, very reciprocal. So I'm glad that you, I to, for me to hear you say that yourself is, I'm so glad you know that, you know, and, and that, or, but that's, I think part of the reason why you've had such such a successful career because you bring your all. And and you are there, open and wanting to learn and and leave better than you entered. You know, leave the room better than you entered. A better musician because of the experience. Well, I mean, I found, uh, as they say, magic mm -hmm. in a lot of the, the sessions. I mean, you go in and uh, they just the way things happen. Right. Um. Uh, it's just that you know, I mean, I've played on a lot of well, it's quite a bit of ones that have been one or two takes, uh, you know, like uh, reunited was one take, mm -hmm. and it just happened to feel so good that day when we right. played it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, got to be real was mm -hmm. one take, you know, uh, I didn't think nothing about that though. But I reunited. I knew that it was it was something. It was bad. That one, right? When you all played, yeah, you, I just knew it. Yeah, and 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 uh, and other ones that I can't think of that mm -hmm. was probably one take. And then the other ones was... that you work for work with, like the Dyke and the Blazers stuff, where we created was great. I mean, yeah. that was that was my uh, introduction into the studios. That's when I first started, you know, doing studio work. So, I mean, this, I have been truly blessed because I've been able to play on so many different types of R&B mm -hmm. and jazz, you know, right? and pop. Yeah. So, I mean, to be able to, uh, to do that, you know, to, to comprehend and understand what the music is about. You know, sometimes it sometimes it's not like that, right? And I and, and I've I played on records that I didn't think was nothing, and they became hit records. And I played on records that I thought were hit records, and they weren't. What do so you it's, think? It's, it's, it's so bad. What do you think makes it's, a hit record? I mean, because it it is very subjective. Like you said, you know what feels good, but that's not always what translate into translates into becoming a huge success. I would say a good, great story and a great accompaniment, you mm -hmm. know, a great accompaniment, accompanying the story. Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, you know, human, you know, I mean, uh, 
and you know it's it's man it's so vast it's so vast though but when you can um how would you say when people understand where you're at where you're coming from as they say right you know then they can feel you know it's pleasant they can feel a pleasant vibe from you it's just you know that's you know that's that's absolutely that's what it's all and about it's very spiritual. case in I mean, point James, um, in 1978, you played on Melissa Manchester's Don't Cry Out Loud album that Leon Ware produced. And I was telling Melissa, or actually Melissa reached out to me because she saw that you were going to be on the show today. And, you know, she said to me this morning that she was in heaven when she played with you, like when you created that record together, that be, it was just a joyful that experience. That was so wonderful. Melissa Manchester, I mean, yeah. I was so in awe that I was able to play for her. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I think about that now. I think about that. I really think about that. And that was so, wow. You know, what you a great, a great human being and a great artist, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was able to, I was able to play with her, you know, play for her, to create with her. Right. I mean, you know, that was. I think people, you know, I'm so I, glad was, you said that, James, because I think people forget that just because you were a part of creating the music, you know, and played on all these hits, that doesn't mean that you're not in awe of the experience and in awe of some of the, the artists who you've had the the privilege to uh, to work with. Well, you know, hey, like I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a musician and a singer. Mm -hmm. And I mean, my peers are the people that I uh, admire, and it's just it's wonderful. I mean, it's just, it's just, Paul McCartney. I mean, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. You know, I get to that I would never have dreamed of working with. You know, or yeah. people, you know, it's of, of different statues. It just you know well hey because when I when I go in to do a session, I, I go in to do my all, you know, give my all and all. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's great for me. It's I wouldn't do it if it didn't feel like that for for me. Work, right. You know, I yeah. mean, it's, it's been some rough days. I can you know, I've had that, but to be able to play with these people that. Are of greatness, who have proved themselves. Mm -hmm. It's great, you know. Do you go in I'm, and say, I, "Hey, I'm going to be with, within this creation"? That's a great thing, you know. I look at that. Well, and so you mentioned Paul McCartney as an example. So, what was that first conversation like when he reached out to you? Well, I, I had no idea. Paul McCartney is a great drummer. A lot of people don't know. Mm -hmm. He plays great drums and yeah. great, great reggae and ska. Mm -hmm. So for for me to play on his album, which he plays, he usually plays drums on his own album. So, yes, he does. Know, yeah, <laughs> I thought it was you know just beyond whatever mm -hmm. you could say. And Paul was very, very cordial to me. The whole time that I worked with him, mm -hmm. very cordial. I mean, we talked about different things. I asked him about the different songs that he wrote and different things. And for me to sit down and, and for him to tell me about, I mean, you know, that's, that's once in a lifetime stuff. So, yeah. You know, it was just great, you know, for him to, you know, I said, man, yesterday, he said, man, yesterday she had big pretty legs. He said, I, I just the title came and I just worked it like, you know, he would tell me different things of that nature. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's, hey, it's, you know, these people have proven, them, proven themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's great to be a part of those situations. Absolutely. I have a question for you. I was looking at your album credits in preparation for our conversation. And the, the first credit 
that I saw was in 1968. It was the Soul Goes On uh, Jerry Butler album. Um, I would imagine you had recorded before that, but that's that one's documented. And then you did you started working with the Watts 100 Third Street Band and recording. And you already sounded great. Like it felt like you already knew how to record. When you hear Express Yourself, it felt like here's here are a group of musicians who know how to record and and make records. And then you moved in 1971, you you began to, to my knowledge that's you began recording with Bill Withers and 1972 was still Bill album that you were producing and playing drums on. And, and so what were, what were your early sessions? Like, you know, the, the soul goes on with Jerry Butler. I was very, very nervous and cautious. <laughs> okay. Jerry Butler, the way that he spoke, he, uh, his, his, uh, sound of his voice kind of, uh, relax, relax me. Oh, it did. Okay. So, and so that was relaxing. Then the musicians say, Hey, you know, I mean, I was getting into, I was, you know, my, my, uh, this is what I'm coming into the recording business. And so the musician is saying, oh, yeah, man, it was beautiful. How are you doing? Such and such thing. That was nice the way you did this, that, and other. But I was very, hey, man, I would be very, very, it, took, it took me a long time to not be cautious and nervous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and making a record, you really got to be relaxed. You got to really be, you know, where you can um, comprehend everything. Right. You have to be relaxed, but also intensely right. focused. Even, even if you got, you, even if you got to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom mm-hmm. and come back, you know? Right. Right. I mean, you got to be, you know, on it. So. Yeah. When, when, very, did it, uh, when did you start to relax? Do you remember okay. a particular album that you played on? Was it like oh, a Phoebe Snow man, or Kenny Rankin see. that you just felt comfortable? Oh, I, or just moments along the way, like me. That that was my experience. Moments along, I guess. Uh, who did I do? Uh, Diana Ross. I started okay. relaxing. You did. When I did a uh, love hangover. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and we recorded that at night. Mm-hmm. So I was. I have. I had started to relax then. So the surroundings were uh relaxed you know it was, it was at night time right and um for some reason or another it was just you know it was just a, it was calm so and you knew the other players and or diane had joe you already sample, met diane or... the famous joe sample was on there oh jo- yeah of course you know and uh, right henry davis who was a bass player mm-hmm. did a lot of more time working and he went with uh ltd he, mm-hmm. he was in that group LTD. Yeah. Uh, um, I can't remember who played guitar that time. Mm-hmm. But um, well, I understand when you say Joe Sample because Joe Sample was my biggest mentor and influence when I moved to LA. Wow. I worked with him as well, and and I think that's the first time that I met you was through Joe back in the early '80s. And but I get that because he just really was an incredible man and and world renowned musician but like he really understood how to mu- how to make music right and he would say well hey man uh, this section here let's mm-hmm. work on this right and so i'm relaxed i'm kind of relaxed now cuz you know right. it, i know that i could do this mm-hmm. you know so that's when i started getting relaxed absolutely you know? Uh, I know that we've got a few people in our live audience. If anybody would like to come up and ask a question, feel free. Uh, just make the request and we'll bring you up on stage. Okay. Yeah. I see Chris is out there. James, while, while we're uh, seeing if anybody wants to come up, uh, is there anything that might surprise people about you that that most people don't know any anything that that you would want to share or you never get a chance to really talk about wow i, I can't 
at this present time, I couldn't think of any. I just okay. I um, uh, I love the fellowship. Right. You know, I like people. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is all about love with me. You know. Yeah. And uh, absolutely, it's wonderful to it's wonderful to love God Almighty and to be a Christian and. I'm just in awe of, of Jesus Christ. And, you know, when he came down and what he did for us, and we know that he's coming back. And um, I'm just, uh, I'm sad that our country is in the state that it's in. You know, I don't know. It seems so unfair. Mm-hmm. I mean, That mankind would want to be uh, difficult to mankind. I just, you know, I just, uh, you know, it's not nice, you know. But we know God is in charge, mm-hmm. you know. But it's, it makes me very know, sad just, as well. I I appreciate you saying you know, that. Mm-hmm. Peace, peace, right, and love. I think it's. Uh, wonderful. That's that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Knowledge, absolutely, and wisdom, learning, mm-hmm. enjoying. You know, it was great. Absolutely. We uh, we have Chris uh, who's joined us on stage. Hi, Chris. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Well, good How after- are you? <laughs> good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to your wonderful guest, Terry. This is a great interview. Thank you, of course, and it's great to have you on the show. Uh, one quick question. Uh, a lot of singers, musicians, et cetera, have uh, roots in gospel music. I was wondering if your guest had any experience in uh, church uh, music. as they come. Yeah, the Mighty Clouds of Joy. Not, and Start naming it's them. It's not as deep. I was a Methodist. I came up as a Methodist. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't as soulful as the Baptists or the uh, Sanctified. Right. You know, I mean, I enjoy, I enjoy, I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm in a free Methodist church that I go to now, but I enjoy the gospel. You know, I enjoy all that gospel music. No, I'm, I, I, I didn't come up with those roots. I heard it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, but I, you know, I, I didn't. But one thing, um, and it's a great question, Chris, but, you know, in, with the list of, of artists who you've worked with, there are so many who have come up in church as well, like Aretha Franklin, for example, who, who you've recorded with, who came up playing church music, but that might not necess- necessarily have been the music that you recorded together. But the I think there's a, a join, like a shared intention and heart about how you would approach an R&B or a rock or pop album because you you have, you share a spiritual background even if regardless of which church you went to or temple or would you agree, James? Well, the feeling, the feeling, it's, it's, right. It's something about, it's something about the feeling of a, a person's personality. You would call it that when right. they're able to bring it out in what they're doing musically. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's really about that. I Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's, that's why I could, uh, um, how would you say, you know, it, it would jail, you know, it would right. jail because you can feel where they're coming from. Like, yeah, I, I, like people are talking, yeah, I know, I, I understand you, baby. I know what, I know what's going on. I can feel it, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's that is the personality that one is able to put in uh, their craft, their art. Mm-hmm. You know, I know she was Chris, does famous. that answer your question or would you? Would you like to expand on that? No, it answers my question perfectly. My son's a drummer, and uh, since he was able to reach the pedals and before he was playing drums to church music and so mm-hmm. forth. But uh, a follow up question is: What do you what do you think of uh, drummers who strap themselves in these drum kits and then they elevate them above the stage and spin <laughs> them around while they play? I'm just curious. It's kind of a silly question, but what is that all about? Thank <laughs> you. You know, I I have. 
I've wondered about that myself. I've never uh, had to to do that. Right. And I don't know if I I, I would I don't know if I could do it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if I could I could do that or not. You know, but um, and I've never been able to ask. I've never. That's a great question because I and I know drummers that have been in you know those situations. Sure. If you want to call them situations, but I'm and I have never asked them about that. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I, that's a good question because I'm going to ask some of the guys that I that's know great. about that. <laughs> but I know I wouldn't be comfortable. I don't yeah. think. I mean, so I'll ask them what made them comfortable. You know, it'd be interesting to find out. You let me know, I'll, and I'll share it on the show. <laughs> we could do, we could do a little five minute video and, <laughs> and tell everybody <laughs> the answer. You can, you can right. come on back on that, um, Chris. Thanks for joining us and. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. Be before we get to my closing questions and then your final thoughts, I've, I've got two other questions that I wanted to ask you. And, and it's just about, the first one is about balance. How have you balanced art and family and business through your life? I, I know it certainly ha cannot be easy, but how have you made it work? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's can be, it was, well, I'm not traveling. When I used to travel, it can be rough. At times, or if you're working long hours where the dinner's cold when you're waiting on it, or if you are supposed to be somewhere or take some, you know, your children or your wife somewhere and, and you can't take it cause, because some work has come up or something, it mm -hmm. can be challenging from sometimes. Right. right. But you have to have a, a good understanding with one another. I mean, you know, we all go through those peak mountains and peaks. And all that. I've been married for fifty-eight years almost, hmm. and um, you know, I, I, my wife. I have to bow down. I don't know if she took. I don't know how she took it. She loves you, you know, because I was everything negative in a way of speaking. I, I yeah. would say it one time. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. not going to go into it, but mm -hmm. for someone to love you and to understand, you know, that's that's. I guess that's called just undeniable love mm -hmm. you know and you know you got to take that you got to take up time with your family you really have to do that and your children is, is that is very very important mm -hmm. you know so i mean uh, you know we that's that's something um uh, that's a life that's a whole another life situation Absolutely. You know, and I can imagine people that are not musicians too would have. Oh, right. Right. That's not know, limited uh, to what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine them, you know, so it's a life. It's a life. You know, it's, a, it's a, understanding is the best thing in the world, as they say, mm -hmm. you know, getting along with one another. Right. Being able to give, you know, be able to give in. So, you know. That leads to an, another question that I wanted to ask you before I get to my closing questions. And because it sounds like you've already started to answer that. And that question is, what's changed about your perspective in life as you've gotten older? You've traveled the world. You, you have seen a lot and experienced a lot. What do you see differently now than you did when you were younger? Well, I've been to a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've enjoyed, but I was all always ready to come home. Mm -hmm. You know, so and so I think that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I've never, never been, and I've been to some wonderful places in the world and under a lot of wonderful circumstances. But when it was time to come home, I was ready to come home. Mm -hmm. And so. I think that that, for me, um, was great. You know, that yeah. was good. That showed us, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's trying, working to be stable. Right. You know, working mm -hmm. within your family. You know, so that, you know. You know, I mean, I've been... That's a beautiful I've thing been, that you've had uh, that in your life. Tempted, and you, we all... You know, we all tempted, been tempted, 
But you have to, you know, you have to back up a lot of times. And sometimes the temptations will get the best of you. That's right. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Well, that takes us to our, our three closing questions, and then I'll give you final thoughts. Uh, the, f the first of those three, and I ask all of my guests this, is since this show is called Making It, James, what does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? After all these years, uh, and I've been blessed and successful, um, uh, I guess making it, I, I don't, I don't think that I've, I don't, you know, I mean, I was aspiring. I wanted to be a, a my, drums was, it was not a drummer. It was not what I was, was what I thought I was going to be. You know, I was going to be a singer. A doo-wop singer. Yes, you know, sir. but you don't, you yeah. never know what life, mm -hmm. um, you know, you never know what, what happens in life. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not bitter about it. I mean, things happen to where I sh should have been a singer, but I'm not bitter about it. I just think that uh, making it is having peace with yourself. You know, because, you know, people, a lot of people are, um, they're not happy. you know, where they are in their life. Mm -hmm. And we all have those days, but I mean, some people just wake up like that. But I mean, you know, hey, by me being a Christian, that has really, really helped me. You know, because I mean, I was all the way out there on the other side. If, if uh, you know, I've had situations like that too. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, Lord bless me, I'm still here. So, Making it, I would think, would be it with, with being at peace with oneself. Mm -hmm. Thank you for answering that. And the second question is: Can you share? Can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Showing up on time, <laughs> practicing your craft, which I still practice. Um. And being able to uh, get along and understand, you know, being able to get along with somebody, you know, I think that that's, that has a, you know, you know. Those are three excellent tips. By the way, can you elaborate on, on your practice? Um, what is your practice? Do you practice, do you still practice rudiments and paradiddles? I or, practice or everything. I mean, everything. I mean, Every, you practice. I mean, drum wise, I practice a lot. I'm not, I'm not a technical drummer and like a lot of technique stuff, but I'll practice that. You know, it doesn't, uh, it's not my forte. In other words, but I'll practice some of it. I listen to some, I listen to some of everybody. Mm -hmm. And then I'll practice, I'll play on, I'll practice, I'll put up a different song, a lot of different songs. And I'll practice and, and try to see what the drummer was feeling. And, mm -hmm. a, and man, that's that's really dense because a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, you take a lot of the records that they recorded that were hit records and uh, you s try to play what the drummer played. Mm -hmm. You know, it, <laughs> you know, everybody has their thing. I say it like that. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, but I practice, I you know the songs. I just like the song, different songs. I might put, yeah. I might. It's no telling what I might practice on. Mm -hmm. You know, at this at this stage of the game for me, right? You know, I still Absolutely. practice my reading. Mm -hmm. You know, because I didn't grow up learning how to read. A lot of people were, were six and seven years old when they started to read. They took the piano lessons, and so right. they were they are avid readers and stuff like that. So it's kind of in them. Right. You know, but that's, that's that a skill that happen. requires, um, regular maintenance and practice. Right. Absolutely. Reading. I do the same. And if I don't never do it again, I still practice because it's yes. my craft. Right. Right. You know. Practice your craft. My closing question before I turn it over to you for your closing thoughts is at this point of your life with everything that you know to be true, 
what would you tell your younger self? What I do what? What would you tell your younger self? The younger people, I would tell them to uh, reach for the sky, you know, um, and try to be comfortable in your craft if you, you know, if, especially if you're a drummer or whatever, uh, mu you know, if you're a musician, whatever instruments you play, mm -hmm. and be comfortable to where you'll be able to, to you know, approach somebody, you know, in a positive way. I mean, it works for people. Mm -hmm. People like people's personalities. Personality has a lot to do, especially in this in this in this music business. It has a lot to do with more so than the music a lot of times. Mm -hmm. You know, be able to be able for somebody to be able to approach you. Right. Be, so right. they won't, you know, that's that's the thing. You can right. be, be a approachable, be likable. Uh musician. But if somebody figures they you're not approachable, they you know, that's 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 not good. Right. Absolutely. Great advice. Uh, before we close, uh, is there anything else that you would like to add to the conversation and share with our audience or with me? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I just, it's a pleasure to be on your show. I want to thank you so very much. Mine, mine as well, James. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's been a real joy to spend an hour with you and, and really get to shine the light on your, your journey and also your experience and perspective. I really appreciate that. Uh, your music has lifted me. Oh, wow. Uh, Thank you so much. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's inspired me and, and it made me feel all the feelings, you know, um, certainly a lot of joy, but you get me on, on my feet moving and, 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 uh, it's a beautiful gift that that you have that you have and that you've shared with the world, and and I appreciate you for that. Thank you, and all praises to God Almighty because He there bestows the gifts on us. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, uh, I want to thank all of our listeners, our live audience, and everybody who listens to us every week uh, for joining James Gatson and I. And uh, I want to encourage you to stay safe and stay inspired. And James, thank you again so much for for being you. I really thank appreciate it. Thank you so you. much for having me that I might be able to share my thoughts with everyone. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Take good care. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Woolman.